Welcome to the America's 360 podcast. Get the inside scoop and the outside perspective on the latest developments from Canada, Latin America, and everywhere in between. America's 360 is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Hello and welcome back to another episode of America's 360. I'm your host, John Molesky. This program is brought to you by the world's number one think tank for regional studies. And America's 360 is a collaboration among the Wilson Center's Argentina Project, Brazil Institute, Canada Institute, Latin American Program, and Mexico Institute. Well, the global pandemic of 2020 has had an impact on just about every aspect of our lives, and elections in particular and democracy in general are no exceptions. So. How serious a threat is COVID-19 to the normal, healthy functioning of democratic practices in the Americas? That's the big question our experts will tackle today. And we kick things off with our Spotlight interview. Here's Argentina Project Director Benjamin Gadan with his special guest. Take it away, Benjamin. Thank you, John. And thank you to Daniel Govato, the Director for Latin America of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, known as IDEA. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us on America's 360. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for this invitation. Latin America's democracies are in many cases fragile, and COVID-19, which is still spreading rapidly in the region, is straining political systems in many ways, including the most fundamental part of democracy, elections. The Dominican Republic held elections July 5th, but only after rescheduling them from May. Meanwhile, Chile has rescheduled its constitutional plebiscite from April to October. And Bolivia has repeatedly rescheduled its elections, which were supposed to take place in May. The Secretary General of the Organization of American States warned that COVID-19's impacts, quote, pose serious difficulties to the organization of electoral processes, close quote. And the president of IFIS, that's the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, cautioned that mishandling elections during a crisis can drive the long-term decay of fundamental freedoms. Danielle, my question for you is what is the state of upcoming elections in Latin America, including in Bolivia and Chile? And what's the region's record carrying out safe and fair votes so far during COVID-19? Benjamin, thank you so much for, for your questions. What we are seeing is that the coronavirus crisis is having a huge impact uh, on the health and the sustainability of democracy and human rights. But the pandemic is also having a big impact in the Latin American calendar. All elections that were scheduled to take place during the second quarter of 2020, meaning between April, May, and June, were postponed to the second semester of 2020. Only a few elections took place in the region during the first months of the pandemic. Among them, the repetition of the municipal election in the Dominican Republic that took place on May 15, the election in Guyana in early March, and the presidential election in Suriname in May 25th. But almost all the Latin American elections were postponed, including, as you said in your introduction, the presidential and congressional election in the Dominican Republic and the one in Bolivia. The original date of the first one was May 3rd, and then this election took place only two months after, on July the 5th. In the case of Bolivia, it's even worse. Both elections, at the presidential and at the congressional levels, you have to remember that because of claims of huge irregularities were annulled last October. And then, There was a resignation of Evo Morales, a new uh, transition interim government headed by President Añez. There was a new date set by the presidential and and congressional election of Bolivia on May 3rd, then has been postponed to September 6th, and a few days ago was again postponed to October 18th. But many other elections were also postponed in the region. The primaries and municipal election in Paraguay that has been pushed into 2021. The municipal election in Uruguay from May to September. The two local elections in Coahuila and Hidalgo in in Mexico. The municipal elections of Brazil from October to November. And also the Chilean uh, referendum that has been postponed from April 26th until October 25th. So as you can see, huge impact in terms of the electoral agenda, but not only in our region. When we see 
the data coming out from our database from, from International IDEA, we see that more than 70 elections worldwide has been also postponed because of the coronavirus. And, you know, the concern is not only the rescheduling of elections, though that's certainly problematic, and you've given lots of examples you know, globally and in Latin America, but we've also seen in the region and elsewhere many leaders taking advantage of this pandemic to restrict domestic opposition, including quieting critical voices through emergency restrictions on free speech and so-called fake news about the pandemic in a way to advantage incumbents. So as Latin America prepares for its next super cycle of elections next year in 2021 and the postponed elections you've referenced for this year, the question is whether you have seen leaders in Latin America using this pandemic as an excuse to disadvantage opposition candidates. Let me split the answer in two parts. Number one is the huge impact of emergency legislation and the excessive accumulation of powers in the executive in many countries. A few weeks ago, International IDEA, uh, together with other 70 pro-democracy organizations, more than 500 political and civil leaders from across the world, we adopted a joint statement under the title, A Call to Defend Democracy. And we were affirming that the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a health crisis, it is also a political crisis that presents a serious threat to the future of liberal democracy. So this is one part of the answer to your question. And we are seeing that this is taking place not only in in authoritarian regimes, but also in those countries where leaders were elected democratically and then now are behaving not really democratically. So this is one area of concern that we need to really pay a lot of attention. The second aspect of your question is what's going to happen with this election that remains in the case of Bolivia and with the kickoff of the electoral Latin American super cycle. Well, we have to take into account that in this year, the second part of this year, there is at least two countries where we need to watch very carefully. One is Bolivia, for the reasons that I explained earlier. And this election and the continuous postponement of this election uh, is going to increase the already very high polarization and the confrontation between government and the opposition. The second country that we need to to watch very carefully is the election that probably will take place in Venezuela on December the 6th, that is a parliamentary election. And that if this election takes place with the current rule of the games and with the current electoral authorities, probably the opposition will not participate and the elections will not uh, be democratically because there are not real conditions to have a free and fair election. But in 2021, we kick off a new electoral super cycle with five presidential elections, Ecuador, Peru, Nicaragua, Chile, and Honduras, but also with three very important legislative elections. One in El Salvador, that depending what is going to happen in that legislative election, we will have to see to what extent this will increase the power of President Bukele that is already having huge problems with the Congress and with the Supreme Court. But also we are going to have another two midterm very important elections that are the one in Argentina and the one in Mexico. So all these elections are going to take place in a very difficult regional context with an economy going down, with poverty and and inequality going up, with high level of informality, and with a I would say a situation where the political regional context will be characterized in many countries with high level of polarization and confrontation. So these elections are becoming extremely important, and we cannot rule out that many leaders will try to manipulate some of these elections in order to continue either in power or to facilitate the continuation of the political parties. Because we have to remember that only one out of the five presidential elections, re-election is possible. That is the one in Nicaragua. Lenin Moreno cannot be re-elected in Ecuador. Uh, it cannot be re-election in, in Peru. It cannot be re-elected uh, Piñera in Chile. And it cannot be re-elections of Fernández in Honduras. But probably also they will try to use in some countries, not all of them, the pandemia in order to favor the political parties and their continuation to be in power. Daniel Zovato, Director for Latin America at the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, IDEA. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. 
Thank you so much. The next time I will ask you guys to invite me to speak Spanish and I will be free. <laughs> you got it. Un placer. Un placer. Muchas gracias. gracias. Bye. Yeah, un abrazo. Thank you, Benjamin, and thank you, Danielle. That was a terrific overview. You've given us lots to talk about and think about, and we'll be doing just that when we return with our roundtable segment. So please stick around. You're listening to America's 360. Welcome back to America's 360. Let's meet the members of our roundtable. You just heard from Argentina Project Director Benjamin Gadan a moment ago. Hey, Benjamin. John, how are you? Also with us, Canada Institute Director Christopher Sands. Hi, John. Duncan Wood is Director of the Center's Mexico Institute. Buenos dias. Latin American Program Director Cindy Arnson joins us. Hey, John. And the Director of the Center's Brazil Institute, Ricardo Zuna. Hey, John. So, the pandemic has hit hard. It's particularly difficult when it comes to public gatherings, the kind that occur when people get together to vote or when campaign rallies occur, or perhaps even when legislators are sitting in the same room. So with that in mind, let's let's start our focus on elections. And Duncan, if we can kick it off with you, is it even fair to consider elections at a time where there are such significant safety issues? What do we know from what's happened so far? So, I mean, obviously, this is a problem that uh, countries around the world are facing. But what uh, what is also clear is that different countries have different levels of, of resources they're able to dedicate to these courses. Here in the United States, we're looking at uh, the possibility of having very high levels of mail-in voting. But that's not always possible in other countries. Um, also, we know that here in the United States, we have a lot of resources that we can put towards uh, election organization and trying to make sure that election voting sites are safe. But when we look across the region, I think that there is a real problem with resource availability, particularly during a pandemic and an economic crisis that's come along with it. We have one example, I think, that uh, there's already been mentioned uh, on this show, and that is of the Dominican Republic, where elections were, um, were scheduled to take place in May, were postponed until July 5th. And uh, you know, that's when the pandemic was really hitting sort of new highs in, in, in the country there. And uh, we saw a very, very big impact upon voter turnout. Uh, back in 2016, the last, uh, last election, we saw voter turnout of close to 70%. Uh, this time around, it was only around 55%. That's a big drop off. The uh, election authorities tried their very best to enforce uh, protocols, you know, mandatory face masks and distancing, etc. cetera. Um, but that wasn't always possible to keep that up. And it's very, very difficult to police, this, police these situations. As it turns out, election day was the day with the highest recorded number of COVID-19 cases up to that point. So we can see here the difficulties of organizing, the impact upon public health, the need for real policy or real policy planning ahead of an election, and the need to dedicate resources whilst recognizing that you are going to have a public health impact because of this. And if you do all of that, you may still see a big drop off in voter turnout. So then what the, it raises the question, then what's the hurry? Duncan just made a case that there are a lot of compelling reasons to just sort of sit this one out. What's the downside of that? Cindy? The downside, I think, I mean, if you look at a country like Bolivia that Danielle was mentioning, the COVID crisis there is exploding. This is a relatively small country by South America standards. The population is about 11 and a half million but it's a country that has a total of 430 ICU beds. The interim president herself has tested positive, as have other government ministers. So to say that uh, Bolivia should go ahead and hold the election, on the one hand, seems irresponsible. On the other hand, this is a deeply divided country. There was a contested election last year where the decision was that Evo Morales, the current president, had been defeated. Um, and he ultimately left the country and went into exile. But there has been this sense that there would be new elections. And to continue to postpone those over and over again leads uh, to you know, this accumulating political tension that could become quite explosive and, and lead to renewed political violence, such as one saw um, around the time of the contested elections last year. Yeah, I think that just look that just shows the bizarre nature of the crisis. Number one, it's global; it's not national; it's not even a war. I mean, there are many constitutions contemplate the possibility of states of exception in similar circumstances, but not ones that last for this long with an indeterminate period um, of understanding, and one where the, it's the entire world that's affected, not just 
one, two countries or a region. And the very nature of this crisis means that public management of the, of the health sector is probably going to be the number one issue in the minds of so many people in the electorate. So the idea of denying uh, the vote at, a ver- at the very time when that's the number one issue on the, man- on the minds of so many voters would be as controversial in the Americas as anywhere else. Cindy pointed out the case in Bolivia. We have Honduras coming next year. And as Daniel pointed out, the list is long of countries, and it is going to be an unusual country where the COVID response is not the core issue at, at play. The other thing is, is that these COVID responses that, Ricardo, you're mentioning require some extraordinary measures that governments are taking. They need the legitimacy of having been recently elected. You're locking people in their homes in some of these cases as you impose these stay-at-home measures. Wouldn't it be nice if the president making those determinations was one who was governing democratically because he or she had been elected and was serving a proper term? Christopher Sands? I would just add that um, something maybe a bit different is that in Canada, the decision was made shortly after the the COVID outbreak to adjourn parliament. And the prime ministers brought the Canadian parliament back together, but only, you know, for a day or so at a time. While he's been spending billions of dollars of taxpayers' money in order to try to keep the economy going. So his government is legitimate. His, His election was in October, so before all this struck, But increasingly, the problem he has is that he's governing in a way that doesn't subject him to opposition. And we recently had the third uh, scandal for the Trudeau government, a major ethics investigation by the parliament of his own behavior. And had he had parliament to chastise him, to criticize him, certainly none, none of the opposition would have said nice things to him. He might have been better able to manage that particular scandal. But as it is, it looks like he's hiding, even though what he's doing is is just trying to govern without parliament because of the difficulty of COVID. So there are a lot of ways that COVID is undermining legitimacy of democratic countries, and, and this is one of them. Is it automatically a case where uh, the incumbents, those in power, have a distinct advantage? Are there any examples to the contrary? John, there are a number of examples because some presidents are not able to run again. They're limited by the Constitution to a particular term, and that is the case in a number of the presidential elections that will take place in 2021, as Danielle was mentioning. I think that there is really no right answer to this question, and that governments are going to be criticized no matter what they do, whether they hold an election before the COVID epidemic is brought under control or uh, whether they postpone it. I mean, just look ahead at a case like Chile, where the, the plebiscite on a new constitution came about because of these roiling historic levels of protest that took place at the end of 2019. And the plebiscite was a, a response to that outpouring of public criticism of the government and of the dominant sort of political economic model. Um, the vote on the Constituent Assembly has been postponed. If it takes place and people who vote one way are not on the winning side, they're going to, of course, blame the holding of the election on the defeat. They're going to say that the outcome was predetermined and shaped by the inability to vote safely. And there should be, I guess, the only way to go about this is really to take up some of the recommendations of the Organization of American States that has a quite robust electoral uh, monitoring apparatus and have these broad consultations, not just a decision by the government or by the Electoral Council, but broad consultations with civil society and with, um, with political parties as to you know, when and how to move forward. Duncan Wood. I agree with uh, with everything that Cindy has just said, but I think it is important to recognize that uh, whilst the pandemic and the pandemic that we're living through right now is unique, um, this is not the first time that uh, we've had to look at elections during times of crisis. And, uh, you know, we've had elections during wartime. We've had elections during uh, economic recessions and depressions. The fact is, is that you know, we can do this, but it requires innovative thinking by policymakers. It requires us to be creative. We have to make sure that we come up with hard and fast rules, which are applied equally to everyone. Um, And I actually have uh, a great deal of faith in some of the electoral institutes and authorities that we've seen develop in Latin America over the past 20 years. If I think about the the case that matters most to me, which is Mexico, uh, there the National Electoral Institute 
has become really a, a world leader in organizing elections. But what they're going to need is actually the uh, the budget, the uh, the resources to make it happen. And uh, what we're seeing right now, of course, is that budgets are being slashed everywhere because of the economic crisis. And I would argue that this is one of the priority areas where we need to insist that policymakers direct funds towards organizing free and fair elections, especially during a pandemic. Cardo Zuniga. So look, I, Duncan is right. I mean, this is doable. It's within the capacity of very capable electoral bodies around the region. The challenge is that the traditional way of voting that we've all come to expect in so many parts of the world, including the United States, is itself the risk. When the act of voting is itself, as uh, Duncan pointed out, the source of infection, as it may have been in the case of the Dominican Republic, and as we've seen in other public gatherings around the world, the challenge is that so many different systems are struggling to put in place the mechanics to have a fair and verifiable vote that gains the confidence of the population during this moment of crisis. And that, to me, seems to, me, seems to be the, the, the essential challenge for all of us, not just uh, you know, in, in every country in the Americas. With just a few minutes remaining, I wonder if we could focus on this notion of what the future looks like. And in some ways, you can't shake the sense that many institutions, not just governments, pro sports, whomever, are treating this as if it's a temporary inconvenience, when the reality may be that we need to make adjustments for the long haul, and we need to stop clinging to the old model. So when you look ahead, what are the countries that maybe have a head start out of the gates on this, where they have, whether it's a tech sector or something that gives them a leg up in trying to develop a new model for elections moving forward that doesn't rely, and maybe even a new model for governance that doesn't rely on getting a bunch of people together in a room with maybe infecting each other. Well, I think that silence tells you what you need to know. The reality is that there's hardly any situation uh, around the region, around the Americas, where uh, you have a system that is prepared for that eventuality anywhere. And, and, and the, but in fact, what we're doing, what we're, what we're seeing right now is we're talking about the elections that are coming during a moment of massive behavioral change in societies in every part of the world. And this is one of the essential uh, roles uh, that everyone has as a citizen in, in democratic countries. And coming to terms with that, just uh, systems, there are countries that have, have advantages. There are, uh, in the case of Brazil, they have an extraordinarily capable and efficient voting vote counting system, but it relies on people actually showing up uh, to participate directly in the vote. But let's look outside the region. Let's look at let's look at Estonia, for example. Estonia, a small country, doesn't have a lot of resources. They have developed an incredible form of e-government, and they have online voting. It's possible to do these things. I know that there's a, a whole range of risks associated with that. Um, but uh, you know, why don't we begin to think in more creative ways about this? If we are willing to make financial transactions to make our purchases online. I think that we must be able to get to a system in the near future where we can vote safely online as well. And voting I think that's one of the things that we have to look at. Voting by Amazon. Chris Sands, you're next, and then Cindy. Yeah, I think that one of the problems that we face when we're talking about changes so close to elections is trust. We, we have real problems with trust in political systems, and we're all living at home, so uh, teleworking, rumor mills, senses that maybe uh, online voting might discourage older voters, which might be part of one party's constituency that versus the other. I think the problem isn't necessarily only technology. It's also our trust in politics and our trust in, in the people who run our politics that makes it hard for us to make anything last minute. And it feels like it might be a, a sudden change that hasn't been well debated. Um, one of the things that strikes me about this discussion is that for many years before COVID, most of the discussion in Latin America and the Caribbean around democracy was around the quality of democracy. In other words, the procedural aspects of democracy had been more or less guaranteed with some very notable exceptions, you know, in Venezuela or Nicaragua, Cuba, uh, where the ability to hold a free and fair election was, was severely questioned. But now we're at a point because of COVID that we're looking at the very ability to hold an election. And when you think about it, over the last 40 years of democratization in Latin America, that is a stunning conclusion and a stunning moment. After all of these decades of improvement in the procedures of democracy and electoral democracy and a shift towards the quality of institutions and uh, rule of law and how that's strengthened to now be back to a point 
where we're discussing the, the very viability of, of elections themselves. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, Benjamin, a, a final thought. I mean, look, we've talked about the infrastructure in the region limiting the ability to manage elections in the time of a pandemic. But, you know, the very democratic institutions are fragile, too, and that's why the elections are so important. So I think Duncan's point of needing to overcome some of the logistical challenges is right on, because this is a region where the democracies may not be able to survive these endless delays in elections. And so, you know, for that reason, I think it's probably worth trying. You know, I'm supposed to say I'm sorry we're out of time because it says so in my script, but I can honestly say I'm very sorry we're out of time. Terrific discussion. Thanks to all of you. Look forward to seeing you again next time around. And also, same thing to our listeners. I hope you'll return for another edition of America's 360. And until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center and America's 360, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining. You have been listening to America's 360, a podcast about the innumerable ties among the nations of the Western Hemisphere. America's 360 is produced and edited by Oscar Cruz, Angela Robertson, and Mariana Sanchez Ramirez. You can subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. To learn more about our programs, please visit wilsoncenter.org. And please join us again next time for another episode of America's 360.